Hello and welcome to another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. Folks, a fascinating episode in store for you today. When I say the word acceptance to you, what do you think? Does it mean weakness? Accepting something that you don't want to accept, for example? Or does it fill you with a sense of contentment, being able to accept some of the realities of life and maybe picking your battles? This week on Real Health, we're going to chat about the power of acceptance and how it can transform our mental health and our well-being. I'm delighted to be joined by psychotherapist and mindfulness teacher Pork O'Moran, whose new book, Acceptance, Create Change and Move Forward, is a simple guide on how to practice acceptance and find happiness in our lives. Pork, welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Carl. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I'm fascinated by the topic. I'm fascinated by the idea. I'm fascinated by the idea of the book. So let's get stuck straight into it. Um, early in the book, you say that acceptance isn't about taking negativity necessarily out of our lives, but being able to deal with it better and deal with the repercussions of it a little bit better. Do I have that right? You do have that right because we have, uh, there's a lot of negativity as well as positivity, positivity in life. And in the wellness field, sometimes one gets the impression that you must not have any negative feelings or thoughts, that that's very bad. Uh, but in fact, it's part of the package, you know. And really, if you have a negative feeling, let's say, about your job, maybe it's telling you that you need to be doing something else, or maybe it's telling you that you need to look for change within it, or a negative feeling about a relationship, you can, it's tell, maybe telling you ne- you need to look at that. So once you accept that that negative feeling is there, then you can sort of deal with it and look at, is this telling me something that's true or that I need to do something about? Or is it just something that I can't do anything about? Uh, So I don't think we should be completely down on negativity. There used to be a self-help book in the shops. I don't see it there anymore called You Can't Afford to Have a Negative Thought. Well, listen, that's that's not (laughs) something that human beings can manage. Because we we all will have some kind of negativity in our lives or a tough experience that brings up negative emotions or something like that. So it's it's almost impossible to think that we can just shut it off or just or just run from it. Yes, it's better it to to yeah. confront it and to, to 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 visit it for want of a better word. Yes, it can be to to confront it. Um, sometimes a negative thought or feeling is not a true one, and you know you can do it, a thing things like asking, "Well, is this really true? How do I know it's true? What's it costing me to believe this thought?" I'm stealing this from a person called Byron Katie, who who whose method this is. What would it be like if I believed something else? But uh, on the other hand, sometimes there are negative thoughts, let's say, about experiences that we've had that we can't do anything about anymore. And often it's necessary to be able to, when you have that thought, but just to let it be, you don't necessarily have to rerun the whole scene, the whole experience of, you know, when that person did me a bad turn, etc., because it's over and they did it and there it is. Um, So, or it might be a loss, you know, that you're having the thoughts about that. And people do that, don't they? they? They revisit past situations, and it could be something very basic in terms of, I don't know, on a sports perspective, you know, scoring a try, you're not scoring a goal, yeah. but on yeah. a more a deeper perspective, it's those tough kind of negative experiences that more often they will have that revenge or yeah. you know kind of concept about or re- or try to rebuild in, in their mind what they would have want what they would have done differently. Yes. And it's although it's very normal, very normal thing to do it's, for people. Yeah, it's very normal, and the thing is this. There's a lot to be said for if this situation comes up again, what would I do differently? But if it's a situation that really isn't going to come up again, going over and over it isn't going to help you very much. Uh, it can make you feel... It can get the stress running again, can get the adrenaline running, cortisol, your blood pressure up, all of this sort of thing, and make you unhappy. So it's worth, it's worth watching out for that. And what's the, if, if people are listening in and that's something that they do uh, on a regular basis with a negative experience in their past, what's the best way to, to deal with that? How do you stop yourself from revisiting it and replaying well, it in your mind? I talk, tend to talk about letting it be. People often say about things to, to let it go. It's kind of hard to know how to do that, you know, how to let it go. Um, because it comes knocking on your door, you know. So, but letting it be would be, you've noted that it's there, you felt the feeling, uh, but you now direct your attention to something else, preferably in the world outside your head. Um, and that might be something really not very uh, profound or significant. Might be drinking a cup of tea, you know. Um, but you redirect your attention and you just let it be. 
um, rather than reanalyzing. It can be a factor in depression too, and people keep analyzing and analyzing and analyzing. They try to solve a problem that cannot be solved, and that can sometimes push them down a bit, you know? Okay, so, so it's acknowledging the feeling and then like, almost distracting yeah. with an external yeah. task. You acknowledge the feeling, you come into some other aspect of the present moment, which is like mindfulness. But in my opinion, a lot of mindfulness actually is distraction, actually. You're moving your awareness to what's going on, as I say, outside your head, usually. My one is mowing, mowing the lawn. I love mowing yeah. the grass. And if I'm really yeah. stressed or concerned or worried about something, I focus on mowing the lawn and yeah. the straight lines up and down the grass. Yeah. And I find yeah. it very mindful. Because yeah. oh, yeah. it, it, yeah. it, it totally pulls your focus to what you're doing. Yeah. And I would tend to go for long walks. I find that does it for me. Um, especially when I'm paying attention to what's, what's around me, you know. Um, uh, for, so it's different things for different people. It's uh, just turning to something. And it doesn't actually, here's the thing, it does, what you turn your attention to doesn't necessarily have to be something that you like. Uh, it can be, um, like some people hate mowing the lawn, you know, but if that takes you out of being lost in that really upsetting memory of 30 years ago, it, it's worth doing because you've got to pay attention to it. So it's moving it to something else. Ideally, something that you'd like to do, but can't always actually, always have something you'd like to do just at hand at that moment. So something else, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. okay. And what about uh, venting or ranting? So if you're someone who consistently rants about someone or rants about an experience, presumably then you're not really going towards acceptance of whatever no. that experience may no. or person may, you know, may, may be. No, you're not really. And um, if you rant out loud and uh, other people can see, God, you're, you need to get over that, you know, you need to get past it. So if you're ranting out loud, you're reawakening it. As I said, all of the memories are, thoughts are physical in the sense that wh what you're thinking affects how your nervous system, which is a physical thing, is reacting. So when you're ranting about something, um, sometimes, no, a certain amount of ranting is okay. But when it's going on, like for six months, six years, um, it's not okay really. It's not doing you any good. Um, and when the ranting is happening in your mind, that's almost worse because it's, there's nobody knows that it's happening who can call a halt to it, you know, and can say, oh, would you just leave it? I've had enough of that. Uh, it can just go on and on and on and on. So that's the thing about ranting in your head probably is how we mostly fail to accept things. It's by all that ranting in our head. And I think it's very important to be able to notice that that's going on and then let it be. So it often starts before you notice it, you know. The thing you find with mindfulness to hear, you're somewhere else in your head before you realise it and then you realise I'm somewhere else. Then you can make the choice to come back into this moment, you know. And if you are someone who does that, who, you know, rants in their, in their minds and overplays in their mind, is presumably talking it out is a way of helping to deal, or is it? Or, uh, yes, it is helping be, yeah. to people to deal with that. Talking it out to somebody who will listen to you and not say, oh my God, that's terrible, I wouldn't put up with that, they're awful. <laughs> they're just ramping it up, you know. So it's talking it out to somebody who actually will listen to you. Yeah. Can make a big, big difference. But sometimes you've got the um, sort of bar stool warriors who can tell you everything. I think Irish people are very good at that. We're very, very good at that, even without bar stools, yeah. you know. <laughs> we're, we're really good at that. And... Um, that's the team. Uh, there was a, a report on the news this week about tea and biscuits, and there was a big campaign yeah. to kind of get uh, gatherings happening again in the office. And one of the things that happen when you get gatherings together in an Irish scenario is people rant and kind of. Yeah, yeah. But what you're saying is, you know, having a rant about I don't know your boss or the weather or whatever. If yeah. it's a sh you know short term thing, that's very yeah. normal and that's very kind of regular. But if it's you're ranting about the same person for six months, six years. That's exactly yes. something that you need to work on and address. And actually, when you're in an organisation, when you go to work in a place, ranting about the boss is a way of belonging. This shows I belong. I belong enough here to know that everybody believes that the management don't know what they're doing. It doesn't matter where you work. Um, um, so I know this, and we're all sitting here saying this because we all know better than they do. That's fine. But you can recognise the person who's ranting about the boss is kind of... It's got a psychological grip on them, you know. They're not doing anything about it, 
but it's got this psychological grip and you're wondering, you know, what's, what are you getting out of this? You're getting nothing out of it, you know? And if time moves on, what do you do if the bus leaves or something like this? Uh, I often wonder that about that, but people we rant about, I'm sorry for being a bit sniffly this morning and up, if I upset your, your innumerable listeners, but that's just the way that's it is today. Fine. I have to accept that. Chat but to me about acceptance and approval then, that they're, 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 two different, they're two different things, they're completely different things. Oh yeah, if I accept that, if I was to accept that I had, let us say, a drink problem, that does not mean that I approve of the fact that I have a drink problem. It means I accept that fact, that eventually leads to change. Not straight away because it's too, it's too hard to do straight away sometimes. But accepting that something is so is not approving of it. Look at people. I sometimes think about if, if, if you had, say, Ukrainians listening to this and they said, yeah, tell us about acceptance. But they had to accept that this terrible thing was coming towards them. Uh, some had to accept that they needed to get out. So the acceptance can be quite a bitter thing sometimes, but it tells you what to do next. It opens that door, you know. Okay. And I think yeah, that's it, it gives you the, the impetus to make the ch- make the decision or yeah. to make the change when you accept oh, yeah. that something. Oh okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and sometimes you would find, so in long the the, relate, the, the research into long term relationships, for example, shows that things that annoy people. Sometimes the same thing about things about the other person uh, goes on annoying person to someone throughout even a long relationship. And you've just got to be able to accept it. And they have to be able to accept your peculiarities. If you can't, then either the relationship won't last or it'll be kind of very you know, cranky and conflicted and snarky. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't things that are deal breakers. And it's a funny thing in a relationship, but not funny, it's kind of tragic. Sometimes when there's something happening in a relationship that is a deep deal breaker, like a kind of physical or emotional abuse, say, it can take people years to accept this is happening and this person is doing it and they're going to go on doing it. It can take years for that. So acceptance isn't fast necessarily. But once the penny drops, then you begin to look and see, can I do anything about this? And um, that's how it's, it's sort of creating change moving forward. Sometimes, tragically, a person cannot do anything about it. But sometimes you can. And that's where acceptance helps, I think. And, you know, you're saying that it's important to accept others and the unfolds and others. But, you know, in the book, you're saying that it's really important to accept yourself. Yeah. And that for real happiness and for long-term happiness, one has to accept who they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, you've got, you've got your triumphs and disasters. You've got your... You're a saint and a sinner. You've got successes and failures. And really, if you can accept yourself, you don't have to be in conflict with yourself for your whole life. Um, you, can, you can accept your imperfections, but you can also accept what's good about you, you know, and what you're good at. Again, it's an Irish thing, I think, that we're terrible at accepting that we're good at something. Somebody pays a, a compliment, and uh, we are immediately push it away, make some excuse. So we're terrible at accepting good things about ourselves. And if we can accept that, it just makes life, I think, so much easier. And um, I think it's, it's the non-acceptance that gets us into trouble quite a lot of the time. If you're not, ex- somebody said that if you, when you fight with reality, reality always wins, you know? So accepting reality is great. And it doesn't mean that you're, it doesn't mean that you're going to feel terrible about yourself. It means that you would probably do what you can to develop, maybe to change, but to develop, to move forward in a, in a way that's good for you. So that is very much accepting that we're not perfect and we all have faults in yeah. some way, shape or form and accepting the fact that we do have faults and, you know, and yeah. coming to terms with that. Yeah, if you think of, um, I, I have this analogy. I don't know how good an analogy it is anyway, but I often think of sort of life's kind of a compost heap, you know. <laughs> There's all this stuff there. And um, if you can accept that, um, there's a, a Buddhist idea in, in one of the uh, books that I, I read about 
about uh, a lotus growing out of a dung heap or something like this. And they're sort of talking about acceptance. You, you're accepting the whole thing. Um, in um, There's a book called Full Catastrophe Living, which is about acceptance of pain, chronic pain. And it had a lot to do with kicking off the current mindfulness movement. And that's based on a line from Zorba the Greek, from that book film, in which Zorba says, I accept I accept life, I accept everything, I accept the full catastrophe of life. So it's that kind of thing, not building walls and shutting yourself off. And a lot of what we're chatting about will link into anxiety in people. Yeah. And, you know, acceptance and by doing that can help to manage anxiety in many ways. Absolutely. I think accepting that you have anxiety about something is really important. Um, let's say you're anxious about something. There's something you've got to do. You're anxious about it. You've got to give a presentation at work or something. <clears throat> if you didn't get anxious about the fact that you're anxious, you've added another layer. You could just say, okay, I'm anxious. I better get cracking on this thing and go in and do the best I can. If you're exa- anxious about uh, an exam you've got coming up, at the time that we're doing this, people are facing exams. Mind you, people are facing exams at every time of the year, as far as I can see. So if you're really anxious about that, it is helpful to ask, Instead of saying, oh, I shouldn't be anxious, is there something I need to do to boost my chances of getting through this thing (laughs) in in good shape? Um, So I think anxiety, remember anxiety is always with us. It's part of the deal. It's, um, and the important thing is not to dwell on anxiety so much that it paralyzes us, but to be able to acknowledge the anxiety is there. Is it telling me something helpful? If not, Sometimes I can just observe the feeling of anxiety in my body and allow it to go. So every podcast episode I do get anxious coming up to to into record. And you deal with that by you read your research, you read your notes, you prepare as best you can, you arrive early, you you know, you deal with all the factors that can help to reduce the anxiety, but you accept the fact that you're going to get nervous or if it's a presentation or whatever, maybe you're going to get nervous, it's going to happen, but you can manage all the other factors to help to reduce it. Yeah, and I think people who do anything anything that involves kind of public performance would find that anxiety sharpens them up a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, th- that they see it seems to gather up their energies in some way. There are actors who get sick every night before they go on stage. Uh, some of them are very good actors. And um, so anxiety can sharpen the axe, actually. Uh, but it's when you dwell on it so much that it kind of stops you in your tracks. That's when it's not good for you. And by the way, when a person, some people are waking up in the morning, they're in a state of anxiety, and they, uh, they, they find it hard even to get out of bed and face the day. But they need to accept, I am in a state of anxiety. This is something for whatever reason, I may never know, my nervous system does to me every morning, and get up and start moving through the day with the anxiety. If you're a shy person who's, who wants to go to the party, you bring your shyness with you to the party. And if it means that you're one of these persons, as I used to be, who would uh, spend a lot of the time in the kitchen, fine. At least you're in the kitchen, people come in and out, you know. You can have conversations with them. Sometimes interesting things happen in kitchens too. But so you've got lots of... Uh, you can Once you accept it, you can work with it. And finally, what about a kind of body acceptance? Because it's something, again, in an Irish context, like the body positivity movement, yeah. people are generally very critical or self-critical yeah. about their appearance or about how they look or about their weight or whatever it may be. Uh, and that causes a huge amount of issues for people. Yeah. Are there ways that people can help to improve their body acceptance or improve their ability to do it? I think that um, accepting the body, I mean, we do live in an era where the body has been not accepted do I think that might be changing a bit? It might be, a, one thing is to not be, instead of looking at the perfect per- people around you, look at the average person around you. They're probably much the same as you because they're average. Um, so there's that. And it is being able to accept your body in that way. It's almost a mindset in a way of accepting your body, not needing to look like the most glamorous person in the room, who often looks quite artificial, actually, the most glamorous person in the room. So it's accepting your body, it's been with you all your life. 
it's having to carry you around the place. <laughs> and um, if there's something you need to do, fine, do it. But not. It's it's a matter of just pulling back from that assumption that there's something wrong with my body, and watching out for, and just realizing that the images you see are not necessarily reality at all. Okay, you so know. again, it's stepping back. It's looking at what's real, what's yeah, not real. It's, yeah. it's looking at the, be, at the the aspects of your body that you like, as opposed to the aspects of your body that you don't like. Uh, yes. Uh, well, it's looking. At, yeah, it's looking at the, the whole thing. You know, it's looking at the whole thing, and realizing that often this thing is irrational. I mean, how many of us have had people say to us that they feel bad about themselves and, and don't like their appearance, and we think they actually look fantastic. You know, it's th there, there's an irrationality of some kind there. If you can accept that it, it's irrational, you can then move on with things. Uh, and you don't have to go making change after change. There is some uh, research from Sweden, I think, showing that people who, people who have cosmetic surgery sometimes feel quite bad afterwards. And it may be because they thought this would change their life. But it doesn't necessarily change your life. It maybe wasn't nothing to do with your appearance. So it's being able to accept all of that. Accepting that whole full catastrophe of life, you know? And very often it isn't really a catastrophe at all. And the, the, the body is, is okay. If you can accept being okay, you don't have to stun millions of, millions of people uh, who will give you likes and stuff like this. Um, just be uh, accepting that you're okay, that's all. And... Um, it helps, by the way, not to criticise other people's appearance as well, because very often we're just projecting our own insecurities mm -hmm. onto them, then criticising them. Whereas if we can, the more we can accept how other people look, the more, we, I would think, the more we can accept how we look. The title of your book is Acceptance, Create Change and Move Forward. I think over yeah. the course of the last 20 minutes, we've covered that in lots of different areas yeah. of people's lives, which that if you accept things, you can help to yeah. create that change, yeah. to move forward and to move on. And it's been great to have you in studio. Thank you so much for Thank coming in much today. Me, Thank you. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. As ever, you know where we are, at Carl Henry PT on Instagram, realhealth at independent.ie. Accept things this week, create some change and move on. That's the lessons from this week's episode, and we'll see you next week. Slongafo. So